the firebox side, you have to put a cap weld over the top of it because the way you clean flues while this machine is operating, if you don't clean them, they're going to they're going to load up with soot, starts acting like an insulator, starts reducing heat transfer into the water outside the flue. It's no good. It's wasting the company's money. So you you have a hurricane going through that tube of fire very fast. You take a bucket of sand and you fling it in there and the sand is blasted down through the tube and it scours out the soot and then it comes down on somebody's laundry or wherever you were going past at the time. Remember putting stuff on the clothesline for your mom? I sure did. We weren't that close to the tracks. So you, you have to, on the end that's going to receive that blast of sand, to preserve it, you, you layer up some metal uh, with a with a welder back at work to give something to a braid away besides the, the flu tube itself. So that little job is done. Now, what about the superheater bundles that are stuck into them? Uh, there are 220 of these things. We had a sponsorship thing going. You could, you could sponsor one of these things for only 100 bucks. Uh, there is a complex set of manifolds that take wet steam out of the boiler, send it through the flu tubes a few times, and bring it back as dry steam. So it's gone from 400 degree 300 psi to 700 degree, 300 psi steam, and that's where you get the explosive force that drives the pistons and it drives the uh, the, uh, the air pumps and some other appliances on the locomotive, and it runs the whistle. So all of those had to be full penetration socket welds, and here's Carlos stamping his Carlos Osuna initials into his completed work. It turns out they look similar to each other, but every one of them has a specific place. This is not a square bundle, it's on a 30 degree rhomboid. So you wind up having to measure everything very carefully so that it'll fit when it goes back in. And if you're smart, or at least we think we're smart, we built the ones that we would install last first. Because they're now at the end of the container and the ones that go in first are at the outside of the container. And each one of them has a specific address. And they, this is a, this is this this got short arms on the manifold. This weighs about 350 pounds, and uh, you can see that a couple of guys here have not calculated exactly where they need to be when they get to the rack on the wrong side. So there's a little duck under problem. We've done some training to, to fix this. They go into a rack. Uh, we're now racking them a couple of times and then doing pressure testing on them. As the boiler must be certified, so must the tube. So we built a little pressure uh, gizmo that we could fill these things with water, and you beat hell out of them until all the little bubbles come out. We are going to compress this water. And I thought Carlos would just do it so stupidly. He walk around whacking things with a hammer, and it turns out he's actually circulating water through there, watching the bubbles, and when the bubbles stop, you're ready to pressurize. 300. One to 400. Five. Five. Five hundred. One more. Stop right there. And so each bundle is pressurized uh, at time. a little more than 500 psi and uh, held for 20 minutes and inspected for leaks. And if it passes, uh, then the end of it gets that information on. It's on a piece of paper somewhere too. But you actually put it on the work. And then you have to blow all the water out, which is actually a lot more fun than this picture looks. But, uh, don't want to rack these things full of water and let them freeze because they will split. So what else have we got to do on this project? Well, we do have to do a hydrostatic test on the boiler in front of the Federal Railway Administration and prove that it'll hold pressure. We have to do 25% over pressure uh, for uh, a period of several hours. Uh, we have to file that Form 4 and then there are repair items that go on a Form 19. We have to install those bad boy superheater bundles. We have to put the fire brick in the uh, fire box uh, which is basically a K28 fire brick that's good to 2800 degrees and uh, it's fairly expensive. It's like five bucks a brick. And so the, pounds of the controls in the cab are being assembled. We have to finish a lot of the plumbing on top of the locomotive, uh, which for one reason or another is rusted out or, or uh, not usable. Uh, the throttle is a very interesting uh, mechanism with multiple sets of valves that lift in sequence as you apply more steam. You've got to put the stack back in. It has a cooled extender. It can actually go up and down about four and a half feet. Um, the argument rings. Did they have an extendable stack to improve the draw through the fire and make it more efficient? 
If so, why did they never put one on a freight locomotive? I think they put them on passenger locomotives because they kept the smoke a little more out of the uh, passenger cars. I mean, it wasn't the crew they were concerned about, they were just the crew. Uh, we have to steam clean the whole thing from the inside. The first time you make a fire in one of these things, you do it with the pistons out. You open the throttle and you blow all the contents of the boiler through the dry pipe, through the manifold, through the superheater bundles, back to the manifold, down to the valves, through the cylinders, and out into the universe, and you clean out all the grit and everything that otherwise is going to wind up in the cylinder while it's operating. Uh, and then we've got to do some trials around town, uh, which we will not advertise, but somehow I'm sure the police will be involved by the time we're done screwing up traffic. <laughs> and then, when everything's done, you put new insulation on the outside of it and put a big sheet metal jacket over it to keep the insulation from flying off. Paint it, number it, and start doing excursions. So we'd like to have you uh, come and visit us. We'd, we'd like, in a few years, the opportunity to sell you a ticket. This is 3751 going to Williams, Arizona with a passenger train. Uh, why do we think we can get away with this? This is us in the city park. This is them in a city park. This is our cab when we inherited the locomotive. This is their cab when they were finished with it. It's like a piece of living room furniture in there. It's wonderful. And we, we believe that you will actually be able to see this picture for your own eyes one of these days. And I would encourage you all to come down and, and eyeball this thing. Uh, bring friends, family, kids, cameras, and take a tour uh, in person. I left out at least 80% of the good stories. So. I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Well, I have to say this is the most interesting presentation we've seen. I think quite a lot from a really different perspective. And the fact that nobody asked any questions shows how captured well, we've got a couple yeah, questions. We got not a whole lot. Do we have questions though? Do we have yeah. questions? Mike, this is out of like a very a sophisticated, specialized process, the whole thing. And yeah. none of us had ever done it before. Right, right. So uh, we have several locomotives that still run, like Silver and Grindo and so on. So do they have to be... God, if we had one of those, we would have been done years ago. Were they, I mean, but do they have to be inspected and yep. checked and all, all they, the They have much... Uh, the ones that the Coopers and Tolldeck like and Durango and Silverton were basically built in the 1920s. They were rebuilt from locomotives that were designed to be switch engines on regular tracks. They actually had to put the wheels, uh, at regular tracks eight and a half, you know, four feet eight and a half inches. Uh, they had to put their wheels inside the frames because they only got three feet distance on the tracks. So they rebuilt some locomotives that were fairly simple. Uh, they have friction bearings, umbrella bearings. They do not have a distributive uh, system. They have very little superheated steam at all. Uh, I mean, we, we have more than 2,000 flexible stay bolts we had to screw with. I saw a picture of one of their locomotives naked. There were 60 of them. Oh, God. Only 60. You know, what a dream. Uh, they're much simpler, but they live to the same standards. The FRA inspection uh, is required at uh, 15 years of intermittent use or 472 days of continuous use. And it's a major tear it apart and, uh, and uh, it inspect the process. It costs, uh, for a locomotive our size, uh, to do that 15 year inspection is on the order of about a million dollars and about a year's worth of work for a volunteer group like ours. So I hope that we, in 15 years, still have a bunch of our guys that know how to do this because I'd hate to break in a whole bunch of rookies on uh, re-inspecting our machine. How does your power tool uh, and it's just compare with what they used in the original Santa Fe shops? They have power tools. Yeah, uh, yeah, I had power tools. <laughs> uh, they also had some things. We had an old guy visit who had been a boiler maker at the Albuquerque shops uh, a couple years ago, and he, he's watching us work these staples, and he starts laughing at us. And I said, "What the hell is so funny?" And he said, "It was the first time in his whole whole life he had ever seen anybody repair a boiler still on the frame." Mm -hmm. In the back shops, they had a 250-ton overhead crane. They just take the boiler off and put it over there where it was easy to get to. I mean, that's why we need those skinny kids to get underneath it and do repairs. Uh, they had very primitive welding uh, by comparison with what we got. They could not do ultrasound. I mean, they didn't do you know, their hardness testing, x-ray, uh, or, or, or fluoroscopic tests. They 